Thank you, everyone. I wanted to first of all welcome you for joining us to the second GPS roundtable on uh, of the science, the fourth uh, roundtable of the my second year. So therefore, I, I thought it was you know uh, <laughs> around that. But uh, the fourth GPS uh, science policy fellows roundtable. Uh, my name is Steve Rutt Garg. I am a assistant professor of economics uh, at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. Um, and before um, we get started with the panel, I wanted to tell us a little bit about uh, the school and what it is that we try to do here. Uh, for those of you who do not know, GPS is uh, the only school of international affairs in the, uh, in the UC system, and therefore the flagship program uh, for international affairs. Um, we started the Science Policy Fellows Program in 2014, and it is an attempt uh, and really a long-term commitment from the school to be thinking about interdisciplinary research and tackling real-world problems that we know cannot be solved within the narrow silos uh, of disciplines as they have existed. Um, and so what the, the Science Policy Fellows Program does is it, it brings in PhD students from STEM fields and pairs them up with faculty members at the School of Global Policy and Strategy as they develop uh, a whole host of policy solutions uh, to real-world problems. And uh, this year, we have three uh, PhD students from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography who are co-sponsoring this event for the second year in a row, uh, as well as a student from uh, the engineering school. And so today, we're going to talk about uh, living with wildfires. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, has been a timely issue, but certainly became one uh, more so today, uh, as uh, there is a, another outbreak of wildfires uh, in the Los Angeles area. So allow me to introduce uh, our panelists for today. Um, we have um, Chief Brian Fennessy, who has been uh, with the Forest Park Service since 1978 uh, and with the city of San Diego since uh, 1990. Uh, he is the 17th uh, fire chief, um, and we're delighted to have him join us today to tell us a little bit about, uh, tell us about his experiences. Um, next, we have uh, Frank Vernon, who is a researcher at the uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and Frank has been working uh, for quite some time now with developing real-time monitoring uh, sensors for a whole host of issues, one of which is wildfires, and we'll learn about uh, the fantastic data he's been collecting. Um, next, we have uh, Ilkay Altintas, who is uh, the chief data officer for the San Diego supercomputer. Um, and we're really excited to have her because she's going to tell us how she's taking Frank's data that Frank has been collecting for quite some time and translating that uh, using the power of big data uh, over at the supercomputer. And finally, we have uh, Judson Boomhauer, who is an assistant professor of economics uh, in the Department of Economics, uh, who does who is starting to do work on wildfires and thinking through how this relates, uh, how we can adapt to wildfires, and what are the challenges that we face in public policy uh, in combating wildfires, particularly the economic issues this raises uh, in terms of housing prices. Okay. So. Um, to get us started a little bit on what wildfires look like, um, I pulled up a num couple of statistics um, where I think most of you uh, who are living in California know that this is an important issue. Uh, but in 2017, there were 6,762 fires that spanned over half a million acres. Um, and this is a sizable jump from what has been the prior average. So in 2016, you had about 4,742 uh, fires spanning about a quarter of a million hectares. Um, and this is interesting because if you go to the California Fire Department's website, and it lists out the 20 major fires uh, of, that have ever taken place in California, 10 of those 20 fires have taken place in the last decade. Uh, and so really, this problem has never been more uh, important and more uh, important for us to understand, and particularly as we move into a world uh, where temperatures are rising, uh, where parts of the world are getting drier, and these problems become more, uh, more salient to us, uh, understanding these issues and really the interdisciplinary approach that uh, UC San Diego, through the School of Global Policy and Strategy, is envisioning uh, is going to become um, quite important. So um, I'm going to get started by, you know, I'll take the, pre we, we want this to be a very informal conversation, so as you have questions, certainly feel free to uh, raise your hand and we will uh, call upon that. But since I have the power of the microphone, I will start uh, with the first set of questions. Um, it's, the, it's the benefit of having to wear a suit and tie to work today. Um, so Chief Fantasy, I wanted to start with you and, uh, and talk a little bit about, you've been, you've been dealing with this problem head on since 1978 and certainly since 1990, since you've been here. 
Can you walk us through what these changes have looked like um, over the course of your tenure um, and how the interplay of technology is changing the way you think about forest fires and particularly combat them? Absolutely, and thank you for the for the introduction. Um, yep, I'll be celebrating 40 years in the fire service this year and uh, got my start. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> A couple days out of high school at that time, uh, I, I grew up in the LA area, Pasadena, Altadena. I know Frank knows where that is. And uh, um, two days out of high school, got a job with the US Forest Service, and they put me on a hotshot crew. I didn't know what a hotshot crew was, but quickly found out that uh, we go all over the Western US and, and fight fire, and I, and I loved it. And uh, uh, promoted up through the ranks to the point where I was a crew superintendent, and I ran hotshot crews up into the point uh, until 1990 when I got hired. And so back then, uh, give you kind of an example of things that changed. You know, in, in the San Gabriel Valley, the San Fernando Valley, where you're seeing some of the fires uh, over the last few days, Santa Ana's are very common. And we've you know, experienced dozens of those fires. Uh, in 1980, one of the real big Santa Ana fires was called the Panorama Fire in San Bernardino out near Running Springs. And it burned 300 homes that night. That was unheard of anywhere. That didn't happen in the United States anywhere. If it was going to happen, it was going to happen. So they, that was remarkable. Nobody then ever thought we'd ever see a fire that would burn that many homes again. And now, you know, 300 homes being lost on a fire, not just in Southern California, but anywhere in the, the country, is maybe a, a news blip. It's not as it, nearly a big a story. Uh, the aircraft we were using were vintage World War II aircraft, uh, Vietnam uh, level aircraft. That was all the modern technology we had, Doctor. <laughs> and uh, radios that didn't work, repeaters, supporting crews. You were literally gone for months at a time. 30 days um, was not uncommon. Fast forward, um, you know, Yellowstone was the big fire back in 1988. We spent many, many uh, weeks there, you know, for probably six months, you know, over time. And, and when I left in 1990, that was really the start of when fires really started to become mega fires. Um, but California, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the state statistics. The uh, Cedar Fire in 2003 is still the largest fire in California's history. There's been a couple that have gotten close, but a, a good portion of those 20 were right here in San Diego. Many of those 20 uh, caused loss of life, not just to, to citizens, but firefighters. Many of the Forest Service you know, policy, the 10 standard firefighting orders, um, the 13 watchouts were born here in San Diego County. Many in the United States believe that San Diego County really is the birthplace of modern day, you know, firefighting. Um, so a, a lot has changed. The technology is just remarkable. Uh, the doctor and I have been uh, collaborating a bit on a, on a project. Uh, we're using, in fact, uh, this morning we put back on contract. General Atomics has a uh, King Air, after they have several King Air that carries the same uh, intelligence package that they put on their unmanned aircraft in uh, theater in the, in the Middle East. And so we are gathering and using that in a fixed wing, uh, you know, a manned aircraft, and we're pushing unbelievable maps, video, you name it, uh, down to the people that need to make, you know, real time, you know, decisions. Uh, some of the things, and I won't steal her thunder that she's doing, are just remarkable. Doing things that we always thought were, you know, really the holy grail, modeling and, and understanding where a fire is going to go and not just relying upon our own fire behavior predictions that many of us have, have learned to hone over many, many years. So um, lots of changes taking place. It's exciting. At the same time, we're seeing uh, far greater fires, far you know, larger fires. They're spreading much uh, faster. And quite frankly, there's, at least in my view, there's no, there's no real end in sight. It's just going to get worse. Uh, that's you know, simultaneously, it's like a, that's like a conversation with my mother, simultaneously encouraging and discouraging at the same time. Uh, so I think it was really interesting that you touched upon uh, this fact uh, that you're working with, with Frank uh, in terms of, uh, in, in a project. I know, Frank, you've been monitoring, you've been building these sensors, these wireless sensors for a very long time. Um, when did you start doing this? Why? And what, is, what has been the transition that you have seen in terms of um, the scope to inform uh, the work that, that, that Chief Hennessy does over here? 
So really, the projects of, uh, we started putting sensors in the wildland were actually started in seismology um, back when I started as a graduate student here and got involved in real-time sensor networks then. In 2001, a professor up at the San Diego Supercomputer Center and I formed a project called HPREN, the High Performance Wireless Research and Education Network, connecting internet uh, putting microwave links running internet uh, communications across the mountaintops in San Diego County going all the way back out to Mount Laguna all, and all the way up to Toro Peak and Riverside County now. As part of that, we thought, oh, let's be certainly scientific and put some cameras up to see what happens and the behavior of the links go down. We get, then the, the radio links get the RSL go down, the signal strength goes down, things like that. We had no idea when we put those things up there that wildfire was going to be the big hit on that. That was where, and but they were quickly used. We started deploying in 2001. 2002, they were she started using on the Pines fire. 2003, they were used on the Cedar fire, and they've been used on every major fire sequence since. And now those, we take images every minute on all these cameras, and so they're built together, and we can build animations for education purposes, understanding wildfire behavior characteristics, how it works with the fuel, how it works with the weather, things like that, and how, those, how they um, tie everything together. The other thing that's kind of interesting, well, I also can see wildfire from the other side of it, because in the Cedar Fire, I was actually in Scripps Ranch. My house was, my previous house was in Scripps Ranch, I should say. And um, I wasn't smart enough to get on the web and look at our own cameras. So it's like, now when there's a fire, the first thing I do is look at the cameras and things like that. Um, but they are now heavily used. The technology has significantly improved. We have very, uh, the quality of the imagery has come up. We're now integrating pan tilt zoom cameras with this alert uh, San Diego gas and electric camera program we just installed in partnership with the University of Nevada, Reno. So we're, trying to extend our coverage scope, which we got reasonable coverage in San Diego County. We still got some holes we need to fill, but we also have, you know, Orange County is, uh, is underserved, Riverside County is underserved. There's no excuse for us not to be expanding the sort of technologies out to make people aware of these data and these what's going on in the environment around them. One of the core elements of these projects is that we make these images available to everybody in real time. You can go on the web and see right now what the state of the county and your region. And like in 2007, we got lots of emails coming in when we had the big fire, the, the witch fire, which burned into Rancho Bernardo and Rancho Santa Fe, and all the media went up there. Well, nobody was looking out about the Harris fire down in the southern part of the county. And so the people down there were able to log in, see what was going on in their neighborhood, and make informed decisions on how they should respond into the situation they were in, which was not being broadcast at all on the news. So it's this type of thing, and then be able to take this imagery, and then I'll just basically hand off to Ilkai here, because basically she's going to take some of the images that we use and fill that in to take it into further future work and modeling, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, that's the, that was sort of going to be my next question, <laughs> which is what, um, you know, this seems like this seems like such a valuable data source. It's it's providing real time information uh, in in an unprecedented way. Uh, but really, I think you know, knowing that there's a fire outside of my house is is nice because it means I can get out of my house. But I'd like to know that a couple of weeks in advance. And so <laughs> I want to know uh, I want to know uh, from Ilkay like what what is what are the advances that we're making uh, here at UCSD in terms of understanding. Uh, how far out we can predict these fires, what are the determinants, what are the things that need to be watched for. And in some sense, some sense that I imagine would feed back to the work that you do, Chief Fancy, which is, uh, you know, if you knew when you needed these resources the most, that would, I imagine, make your job a lot easier than just when, uh, you know, just responding always in, uh, in real time. So, you know, if you can uh, elaborate on, like, what, what, what it, it seems to me that, like, you know, with the advent of, uh, the age of big data that we live in, this is a really exciting opportunity. Yeah, anything short of uh, a glass bowl <laughs> will be useful. Um, so a couple of weeks ahead is a lot maybe, but this type of data is really enabling making decisions or understanding what's coming in the environment in case there is a fire. 
So STG and our uh, energy company is actually building a fire weather index that goes uh, back a week these days. So um, when a fire weather index goes back a week, uh, that gives the chief and others a, actually a way to plan resources that much ahead so they don't have to do it a day or two ahead when uh, they know it's coming. So that helped definitely to manage resources that way. Uh, the other thing is having access to information in real time, as uh, both uh, Chief and um, Frank were mentioning. Uh, in 2002-2003, while this network was being built, we were actually um, streaming data from the sensors that are out in the field and doing analysis on geophysical data or weather data or even images coming from the Scripps ships. Uh, Frank and I had students who are now managing autonomous car programs, so we actually trained them well. Uh, and we trained ourselves well, so to say, and the network was being useful in the same time. A lot of relationships between the fire department, CAL FIRE, uh, were being built and the network was being useful to incidents. Uh, since then, I think it was more than 20 major incidents in San Diego County. Um, the network provided situational awareness. Um, so there was access to then analytical tools and supercomputing and data management infrastructure. And there was relationships being built and real time data was slowly becoming available. So a natural progression to that has been building a system that integrates all these and provides um, visualization tools and predictive analytics tools on top of them. And Larry Smart is sitting there and, and the Qualcomm Institute, uh, there has been programs to pave the way as well in bringing this information together with 3D environments, for example, in the meantime, uh, to look at the sensors, to look at the county and even to, uh, with an idea to to use it to train firefighting uh, communities uh, on the effects of the fire and the effects of the fire weather. So all this was there and uh, it was the times of big data that our ability to measure and uh, analyze information was growing. So what we end up doing is bringing together a collaboration that we called Wi-Fire and it is an add-on to fire and the Wi-Fi that was provided by our <laughs> network here, so very creatively. Um, so, and at that time, I can tell you, San Diego County was the environment that we could do this because there was access to all these weather stations and real-time information. And all we intended to do was to build a research project as a test bed that we can show usage of real-time information and learn about the dynamics of the fire as it's happening. So just like a hurricane forecast model or weather forecast model, we can look out into the future, a couple hours into the future, and use the data and provide where the fire is going, how it's spreading, at what speed, in real time. And real time at that time for us, as a metric, we said it to ourselves, if we can do this every 15 minutes, we'll call ourselves successful. And it was sort of this pipe dream um, which turned into reality. And when we first talked about this, the first thing we heard was, oh, you'll never get access to that data. So we were almost like, uh, my nose was gonna be flat almost. <laughs> and so because you know, there's no data, there's no data, that's all we kept hearing. But in the meantime, uh, systems were changing. NASA satellite systems were changing. Uh, uh, networks like HPRN, uh, was coming up uh, with the example that HPRN said, now there's Alert Tahoe and there are other places that are trying to set up such networks. So the system was in a way timely to catch that revolution, so to say, to sense and stream real-time information into systems like this. And the whole goal here during a fire is to turn all the information we are getting and turn that into a bit of information on where the fire is going to and at what speed for the next six hours. And the reason we are doing it for six hours is beyond six hours, everything will be done. And within that six hours, we are able to get more data and adjust the models properly based on the real-time data we are getting. So we can dynamically actually change the model and keep uh, in a continuous way, provide that inf information through geospatial interfaces uh, through the web and through things like iPads 
to the uh, chief and the crews managing the fire. So. Else so, so, so I know that, um, that the platform that you developed in, in there was a period of five days um, in Northern California that something like 300,000 people accessed this, something like uh, like 3 million hits in a five-day five period. Um, is this the, the sort of the largest dissemination of this information that you have seen on wildfires? I believe so. I haven't went back to check that okay. to be a fact, but... It was definitely a huge amount of interest from the public. And that even with the limited uh, functionality that we are providing to the public. As I said, we built a system uh, initially for, uh, as an intelligence platform to firefighting groups. So we didn't intend to make predictive models available to the public. But there is also public information, like the official fire perimeters that are announced and the detection of fire from NASA satellites, weather information, red flag alerts, smoke alerts. So all of these are public. Uh, so the public is really looking at accessing that information. That is for the public uh, from a unified interface. And that part of it has been amazingly useful. And we didn't even disseminate it. It was completely organically uh, disseminated by the users. Uh, someone heard on the other person heard. So it's a word of mouth dissemination, so to say. And in five days' time, it's reached out to 300,000 people. And from the LA fires, another region, uh, so in each set of users or uh, public access, uh, we are at about 50,000 just today. So definitely the public's need for access to information has risen also over the years, has increased over the years. And these type of systems will be important to transparently share that information. And, but there's still, with a word of caution, that we are not sharing predictive information. And we would like that to come from the authorities. And we have a working relationship to get uh, the perimeter information, as the chief mentioned, from places like GA who can get that to us really accurately so we can improve the accuracy of the models over time so we can put that information to good use. And maybe there will be a time we'll trust these models and public's uh, understanding of what the model is that we can share these in a more transparent way. Yeah, I, I, I want to get back to that. But before that, I want to sort of talk a little bit about how people react to this, and Judd, this is this is very much your area in terms of understanding how people are. Um, you, you know, in, in economics, we often think about the you know the the, inf the influence of information is very very large, and 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 the the information that Ilkay is talking about is really at a massive scale. My simple question is, why are people still living in California? Right? <laughs> it's that it's uh, and 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 the. Uh, and and I and I understand this, and it's not that like housing prices are in any way suggesting that people are scared of these fires. I mean, I just bought a place, and it, it you know it's just not in any way feels like there's any uh, like people are, are are people factoring in these 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 costs of these fires, the scare from these fires. What is it that uh, why are people located in high risk areas? Can you tell us a little bit about that? So, great question. Uh, California is a pretty nice place to live, first of all. Uh, uh, so I think I'm not surprised that people continue to want to live here. Um, but I, So I should say before I say anything that I'm a relative newcomer to this topic, right? So uh, I'm very happy to be on this panel, and I think I'll probably absorb more knowledge than I impart today, but I'll, I'll do my best to provide kind of a public policy and economics perspective. Um, so, and and... I can tell you about some work that my co-author Pat Bayless and I have been getting started on where we're thinking about housing markets and uh, incentives to, to construct homes and how developers and homeowners think about fire risk or don't think about fire risk when they decide where to build homes. Uh, I think our panelists will all agree that you know, fundamentally it turns out that a lot of the places that are pretty high fire risk uh, locations also have a lot of other really nice things going for them. So there are a lot of reasons that people would like to live in, in what we call the wildland urban interface, areas of uh, private development, home development that border on uh, areas of wildland vegetation. 
So there are a lot of recreational opportunities, there's beautiful scenic views, uh, there's relatively cheap land compared to urban centers. There are a lot of reasons that you might want to own a home or rent a home or build a home in those places. There's also a lot of fire risk, as I mean, and growing fire risk that goes along with living in those places. Um, and so I think your question of whether people are accurately pricing that in when they make their development decisions is a complete first order question that uh, has a lot of relevance for how we think about public policy. We don't know the answer to that question yet. I mean, Patrick and I are trying to think about that question. I will say that there are, we have a, some reasons to suspect that those things don't get fully incorporated into uh, development decisions. And one of the big reasons is that the way we pay for a lot of the incredibly amazing and sophisticated firefighting efforts that are just just awesome and mind blowing and, and it's so cool to hear about uh, the work that people are doing on this. Most of that at the end of the day doesn't come back to the individual developers or homeowners who, uh, who are making decisions about where to develop or not develop. So from, a, from kind of a cold hearted economics perspective, we shouldn't expect people to be taking those things into account when they decide where to build a home. Uh, and that's, you know, that's at the heart of the research that Patrick and I are doing, which I, could, I can tell you as much as you want to know about. But the, the basic question, as most economics questions tend to be, is pretty simple. And there, it seems like we have a, an incentive conflict, potentially, uh, that we're interested in understanding a lot more. Can you tell us a little bit more about what this incentive conflict looks like? Uh yeah, well, so maybe maybe the thing to do is to tell you a little bit about the, about the paper, and I, I can tell you what we, you know, what we've learned so far and what we have left to learn. Um, so it, that it, what we are interested in doing in this research project is is understanding what this incentive conflict looked like. If it, if in practice this is something where the magnitudes are such that we should be worried, or if this is something that just kind of washes out in the noise of all the other things that you might think about or not think about when when deciding where to build a home. Um, a few things that we know from previous work, we know that a, a major driver of firefighting costs is efforts to protect homes. And you know, our panelists should obviously uh, interrupt me if they disagree. Uh, but the, a, a very important component of what determines the costs of, of fire suppression is efforts to, as I, as I would say in my very uh, non-specialist jargon, to stop these things on a dime as opposed to, to letting them uh, burn out in a, in a less expensive fashion. So we know that, that protecting homes is a huge component of firefighting costs. What we're trying to do in this project is we're trying to think very empirically about, about that issue. And so we've, we've put together a big data set of incident level fire suppression costs for about 20 years. We're trying to pull together incident level firefighting cost data from as many federal and state agencies as we can, which in itself turns into an, an enormous data management problem, the, this, which, which I will talk about at, at length if you get me going. But that's, that's been a, quite an exercise to just to get access to all that information and start trying to put it together and, and clean it up and make sure things are accurate. And then we're merging that, that big data set of, of historical firefighting costs for thousands of fires to real estate data for the for all 17 million single family homes in the Western United States. So what we're doing, what we can do, subject to some modeling assumptions, is we can take these historical firefighting costs and we can allocate those across individual homes and, and calculate roughly, uh, subject to a bunch of, of assumptions, what has approximately been the cost of protecting you know, every individual home from wildfire for the past 20 or 30 years. And then I think more interestingly, we can try and say things like, well, on average, if, if one were to build a new home or a new development in, this, in, in an area with a particular set of fire risk characteristics and a particular development pattern, a density pattern, what should we expect the cost to the federal or state government to be to protect that home going forward? Um, that's, that's where we are in the project. And, and so we have some very preliminary conclusions, which I'm not going to throw any numbers out there because they, they are not at all concrete yet. But I can tell you that you know, from a preliminary conclusions perspective, it looks like 
First of all, these numbers are very large, which I think is not going to surprise anyone in this room. Um, that homes that are built in high-risk areas are actually create quite a large 